All right, guys, I just got done recording the CEO interview with Jeremy Fromer from Created, ticker symbol CRTD. This is a stock that I've been investing in for quite some time now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with my YouTube channel. But it's important to note that neither I or the company or any affiliated parties were paid to do this interview. Both parties just did this interview out of their own free will to start to better understand what the company is and what the company does, what the growth prospects are, how accretive this business is, etc. It's also important for me to note that I am not a financial advisor. I am just a 19 year old who was blessed enough to get a thousand percent return on my Robinhood portfolio last year in 2020. And if there is one question I get asked the most, it's Rex. How did you get a thousand percent return in 2020? We track this on the YouTube channel so you can go back and see all my old videos. They're kind of cringe. But by watching those old videos, you can kind of see the path I took and what it took to get to the point where I'm at now. But the simple answer is I did the hard work that almost nobody else was willing to do. At 18, 19 years old, I read 10 Ks. I read 10 Qs. I read statement fours. I listened to conference calls. I listened to CEO interviews like the one you're about to listen to. So if you are serious about investing, I don't have anything to sell you. All I am telling you is that watch this entire interview. This is a great example of doing the hard work that nobody else is willing to do. Hardly anybody is going to be willing to sit down and watch an hour to an hour and a half interview with a CEO of a stock. But the people that do catch up on certain nuggets of information and certain reasons and catalysts to believe that the stock price is going to head much higher over time. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, there are several nuggets that the CEO gave us in this interview. So whether it takes you several different sessions to get through this interview, or you can sit down and watch it all in one, I highly recommend if you want to be serious about investing, that you watch and listen to this entire interview. On a last note, if you enjoy these CEO interviews, leave a like down below to let me know that I I should do more of these in the future. Also drop a comment how many shares of this stock you already own or plan on buying after watching this interview. I also want to note that my paid monthly members were able to ask questions in this interview and get those questions answered. That's one of the perks that comes along with paying for a monthly membership with my channel. If you want to see the other perks and benefits, just hit the join button down below located right next to the subscribe button. Just a couple of days ago, we did a members only live stream on my YouTube channel where we talked about realizing how blessed we are even if our portfolios have been cut in half, if we're losing money, just count our blessings no matter how many few or how many you actually have. There's always reason to be thankful and reflect on the blessings we have. There are so many people in the world that don't have the fortune of being able to invest in stocks and companies. So that in itself is a reason to be thankful and to realize how blessed we are. Also, I just realized this, but my sweatshirt probably looks really weird, but this is not part of the sweatshirt. It's a carry-on bag. So uh, with that cleared up, let's go ahead and jump into the interview. Interview. So I have the pleasure to be here with the CEO of a company. I am, I've been invested in for quite some time now, uh, created ticker symbol CRTD. Uh, CEO Jeremy Fromer is here. I'm looking forward to hearing some of his answers to my questions. Uh, it seems like we have very similar personalities to each other. So this will be good. Um, but just to start things off, I think it'd be appropriate for you, Jeremy, to give kind of a general overview of your, your company for anybody that might be new to this thing. So go ahead and do that whenever you want. Sure, Rex, and I'm happy to be interviewed by you today. Um, I'd love to give an inter I'd love to give an interview to someone like you because in the overall uh, description of our company, uh, you are sort of the epitome of that. You are a creator. And Created is a company about partnering with creators. How we do that uh, today is through our vocal platform, which is a creator platform where all sorts of creators writers, musicians, artists, photographers, poets can all publish um, their works and get discovered and be rewarded for that. And in fact, the origin of Created as a company was my partner Justin and I were looking to repurpose legacy assets that existed in private equity and venture capital libraries, content, untapped, unleveraged. 
this is as far back I was doing it in 2012, 2013. My partner and I met in 2014 and he had the vision of how to rejuvenate these legacy assets that were really just depreciating in value. And we started to invest in some of those assets. And we successfully pulled off what I thought was a reasonable business model uh, at the outset, but one that wouldn't be scalable and one that would evolve into the creator first mentality that I mentioned earlier, sometime around 2015, 2016, when it was very clear that we had to build our own technology if we were going to stick to our core missions of, at the time, getting content discovered and figuring out how to monetize it. And eventually, again, we realized that it was the creator community in 2015 that shared that difficulty with us. Individuals like yourself, people are going to ask Jeremy, why did you do your first interview with a 19 year old who put a video together about your company? Yep. It happened with my other interviews that I've done too. <laughs> oh, and I can't wait to answer them. <laughs> and the answer is because that's what our company is in truth. Mm -hmm. Transparently in 2016, we launched the vocal platform. And since then, we've been bringing on creators to our premium subscription model called Vocal Plus. And we've been introducing new features. And we've been having really great success in what is the agency side of our business. And we've had some recent success in what is our uh, growing, but still relatively small um, investment and acquisition strategy. And you know that we've taken some small positions in direct-to-consumer companies, but all with the same basic mission, putting creators first, helping them get discovered, and helping them get rewarded for their creativity. Gotcha. Well, that's a better overview than I could have done at your company, but that's to be expected, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I really enjoyed that, uh, the investor call, uh, I think that was last week or a couple weeks ago now, lose track of time. Um, and we talked briefly earlier about this whole SaaS platform or this SaaS business model. And I think, and I think, you know, it too, vocal created in general over time can really develop into a highly profitable business. And in that, in that conference call, uh, you or one of your partners referenced break even this year in 2021. Uh, my question for you is, what does the road to, profit, to profitability look like from 2021? Does this mean profitability will come in 2022 or are we going to have more break even years? Because I know you've also referenced maybe 2022 being the big acquisition year. Well, there's a number of questions but, but that you're asking in that one, but let's peel back some of them, right? Um, right now, as I discussed on the call, and I've said publicly, uh, first quarter is expected to come in between 650 to 750 in revenues up from the previous quarter. But to answer your question, I'd rather look forward than backwards. Mm -hmm. um, in general, it costs to run the company, as I've articulated many, many a time, anywhere between 700,000 to 900,000 a month, or 2.1 to 2.4 million a quarter. And when I say run the company, we can create, if we did not do any legitimate marketing spend on top of that, 
which is often a financed part of our balance sheet, which is the logical way. Uh, in fact, that's the existence of the entire factoring business, right? Mm -hmm. our, our widget buyers or our uh, community of consumers, or in our case, our creators, right? We want to expand that uh, group both horizontally and vertically, meaning currently we have a, a string of revenue features, revenue producing features, and those that portfolio will grow. There will be other offerings. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we will be vertically growing the amount of creators. And how we grow creators is a very interesting thing. Right now, with 20,000 creators, we can ostensibly project for second quarter, if we really did no further marketing spend, zero, mm -hmm. that we would spend approximately, what I just articulated was about 2.4 in basic operating expenses. We would, organic growth would trump churn, not by a great deal, 5%, 6%. And then we would wind up doing in the agency world, 400 to 500,000 again, just like we did in the previous quarters. And as I articulated publicly again, mm -hmm. and so you can already project that while we will spend more money because we will market. If you wanted to break it down, the company would produce 1.1 .1 to 1.3 million of revenues in second quarter mm -hmm. and would only cost 2.4 to run. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the road to profitability really is dependent on kind of like the pedal to the metal. Do we want to uh, be a company that needs to break even cash flow wise, meaning let's take out the marketing spend again, because typically we'd set up a financing vehicle against that. If you want to look at the company in that sort of linear way, you could just expand the credit facility and our revenues would just grow further. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about the road to profitability, the question then becomes how long until a creator turns profitable for you? Mm -hmm. That would be another way of addressing the question. And the answer would be that depends. Uh, at times, we've been able to get a creator who would typically generate two to four years of revenues, i.e. $9.99 a month for 12 months times however many years you want to put, against what has been over the last few years, no, not the last few years, last year, a, a subscription acquisition cost on our side that I've publicly articulated to have dropped from as high as three, four hundred dollars all the way down to under 200 and has recently dropped as low as 150 to 180 for a subscription acquisition cost. Now, I don't necessarily want to spend that much, but if we did, then break even will take longer. If we don't, then we'll grow at a slower pace. In fact, quite frankly, um, we throttled back all of our marketing spend for 20 days recently, 15 to 20 days. Uh, I think we cut it down by like 80%, uh, 80%, wow. just brought it down right away because we wanted to be able to uh, spend a solid uh, quarter 
focusing on analyzing what is an incredible amount of data to bring that subscriber acquisition cost even lower. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we've been working on. Um, and that's when you talk about profitability, it's can you continue to bring that subscriber acquisition cost down? And can you continue to expand horizontally and vertically on the top line? with new features and new creators. Hence the sort of Spotify freemium to premium model. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. And I know um, part of that subscriber acquisition cost has probably been somewhat inflated because of the whole situation with Facebook. And I know you guys have expanded to marketing, advertising via other avenues like Snapchat. And I personally have seen your advertisements on Snapchat. Um, my question becomes, have you, obviously there's limited data you have so far, but have you found those other avenues like Snapchat to be as efficient as your marketing campaign with Facebook? I'll answer that from 10,000 feet up for you, uh, Rex. Uh, marketing is not that linear. It's pretty dimensional. People who understand what a vocal is uh, will understand that dimensional nature of it. But I'll give you some insight into that, right? We run uh, dozens of variations across dozens of external platforms, targeting dozens of different groups. So when you start to think that way, if we were doing a sci-fi geek um, uh, challenge, it might be that Twitter is not the cheapest, but brings on individuals that have the longest duration. And once I sort of open your eyes to that one, you can see, oh my God, there must be hundreds of those iterations. So there's no ability for me to say to you, Snapchat or this is better than that. That's not, meaning people who say that, they're really just looking at one channel, right? And one linear question. They're not even going deeper into the understanding of what the real data behind it is. And so when I see you have a better understanding now, Rex, sort of as to why you can't, what you have to be able to do just like you do as a money manager is you have to understand portfolio risk. You know, you have to be able to break up that spend accurately and with a, with a plan behind it, meaning you, your performance may change where Twitter is more favorable uh, in the mid of the year, but uh, advertising through um, Instagram during the holiday season is the cheapest, you know, or the most expensive. Yeah. And so again, it's dimensional upon dimensional. And that's one of the big reasons why if you're not built like a platform like Vocal, if your fundamental framework for your technology platform cannot properly evolve the way a vocal can to understand those variations, then they're neither going to be able to draw consumers for themselves or even the brands they partner with after a while. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess I, did, I hadn't really thought about it on that dimension, but yeah, thanks for explaining that. Uh, I'm sure my viewers are going to really appreciate that too. So we've already discussed how, uh, how important Vocal Plus creator growth is to the, the created company as a whole. And obviously, I mean, we're expecting rapid growth in the number of Vocal Plus premium creators on the vocal platform. So my question is, that's going to level off at some point, right? It's 
it's just going to happen. So my question is, at what point do you personally expect that to be? Now, that could be a number, that could be a year. Um, I don't know. It's, it's again, I'm going to try to take you through the pinhole a little bit, right? So let's start at the very top level, right? Vocal is an evolving thing. One of the most important things I was taught by um, the two partners at uh, Think Mill uh, that uh, are really uh, the true partners to my partner, Justin, who's not only president of the company, but really designed and ideated the product itself. And he worked with uh, two incredible, incredibly talented individuals uh, who run Think Mill. And I got the, uh, really the, the, the luxury, the honor to go spend some real valuable time in Sydney with them years back. And the thing that they taught me when thinking about vocal is to remember that the thing is not the thing. You know, there was a hubris of the old generations that you probably, well, you weren't around for some of the early ones. Uh, um, and you were probably like a young Mozart running around uh, at the second stage ones. But in each of the previous stages, particularly in the dot-com bubble, there was the perception that the actual stasis we were at in technology was a final stasis. Mm -hmm. Hence, underground bunkers with millions of servers that went until they figured out the cloud, some of them probably weren't even running. Or if they were at a certain point, there was a natural need to evolve, hence the cloud. And that followed tremendous um, structural changes in the technology space. And even then, people still believed on many levels that they were in final stasis. The last final stasis falsehood was that uh, display ads was the end all. And that if you could get views and clicks and you could arbitrage, you were going to be a billion dollar company. When we build Vocal, we realized that the thing is not the thing. And so the framework of Vocal is literally built to evolve. Mm -hmm. From the ground up, it's built to be accreted collective in process. The creator fulfills a flywheel effect inside of the system that benefits them. The brand powers a flywheel effect inside the system. And now we're in this final stage of technology now where platforms can be meritocratic in nature, where a creator can benefit from the existence of another one without being competitive and where platforms like ourselves and Substack and Medium and Patreon, all of us, we can exist also in a cooperative fashion, not a competitive fashion, accretive to each other. And that's kind of the new age of tech. So when you look at your question from 10,000 feet up, right? What vocal is going to be in the future is evolving. What I can tell you is that there are all sorts of roadmap plans and they, they are coming. Features, uh, um, new communities, perhaps new tiering structures, perhaps some features that people think uh, are more socially oriented, but perhaps we do them in a unique new way. But what we will do is expand the platform such that the notion that there is a leveling off is not something 
that we concern ourselves with because wherever we look, when you have a platform like Vogel, we see opportunity. You see it. You've had certain conversations I've seen where fans or trollers or whatever love to question you about plant camp, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't understand that what we're doing is using the same basic strengths we have to convert creators and do what we do for external brands on our agency side in a virtual company with great partners, industry veterans, as you've seen, mm -hmm. and create tangible value while generating revenues. That shows you that the thing is not the thing. And so when you look at created, we have plans soon uh, working with a particular segment of creators that we haven't even scratched the surface with yet. And so leveling off is not so much a theory when you're not thinking linearly, right? When you're thinking dimensionally, when you're thinking, ah, we're going to partner with one other community and they're going to bring 10,000 creators on in 10 days. That mm -hmm. kind of thing that occurs when you have a platform like ours. Does that help explain the leveling off thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's very powerful. That's something I look for in all my investments I make is the accretive nature of the business where different business segments help each other. The company's looking to make creative acquisitions and that sort of thing. So that kind of segues me into this next question a little bit. Uh, in the conference call and several times in the past, actually, you've, you've mentioned you're eyeing acquisitions of agencies um, that do two to five million dollars in revenue. So is, is the two to, my question is, it might be a dumb question, but is that two to five million dollars in revenue, is, is that per agency that's going to be doing two to five million in yeah. revenue that you're looking for? Yes, yes. Okay. Meaning, look, when I look at acquisitions, especially having come from the financial uh, world, um, there's a particular profile that we're looking for. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at currently, uh, agencies, preferably in the sort of Northeastern, uh, uh, part, uh, of the country to, um, that are doing between, as I said, I think two to four, two to five million mm -hmm. in revenues. We understand that space really well. Uh, we understand that those founders are struggling now, a lot of them that we see. And we already have a number that we're, you know, looking at and, and we've been talking to. But um, I think that that business model worked for uh, six to 10 years. You know, again, it, it gets back, as we were saying, Rex, to the notion of there's hubris in believing that anything is at final stasis, right? Mm -hmm. So just because you understood search engine optimization four years ago and built an agency and brought on clients, if you did not evolve that agency with the best in practice tools from everything from the actual search engine optimization to the running of your agency, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're struggling today struggling to grow mm -hmm. because there's a great divide coming between groups that understand this next iteration of technology, which the most important thing was understanding there's no more final stasis. This third iteration of where we are today with platforms like ours and Spotify and Airbnb and Patreon is the evolutionary nature of the platforms. It's the ability to figure out how to do what you are articulating, leverage the collective. Mm -hmm. And those who are not set up for it just can't. Gotcha. Um, so just to expand on this a little bit, uh, it's number off the top of my head, I could be wrong, but I think uh, as of last quarter created had seven or $8 million in cash on the balance sheet. Um, 
so obviously if you're looking at you know making more than more than one of these acquisitions of agencies in the future we're, we're going to come to a point in time where we have to have to raise funds somehow uh, and you mentioned in the conference call you have three avenues of doing so you have your sh your new shelf registration you have your lines of credit and then you have your warrants outstanding obviously with the warrants you can't really control much of that but between the shelf registration and your lines of credit which avenue of funding would you preferably go with or does it depend on how much you need at any given point in time where's the stock trading at <laughs> i'm not in front of the screen are you <laughs> i'm not i'm not i can look so tell me what it's trading at today so for the record anyway we can record it this during this interview this is where the stock was on that day all right, I'm sh I'm showing four dollars and thirty five cents. Okay, no, I wouldn't sell any equity down here. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like the answer. I have to say. <laughs> All right, so um, we talked a little bit about ads previously, uh, and I kind of had my mind start spinning just with being a YouTube creator and seeing the targeted ads that um, that are on on the YouTube platform. So my question for you is, are there any plans for Vocal in particular to implement targeted ads beyond the brand marketing campaigns to like the different communities on Vocal? Because you have a lot of data here where you can obviously have probably very efficient targeted ads. Um, I don't know if that question makes sense, but it does. It, it does. I again, I I've often told people that uh, this company is a hybrid, you've heard me say, it's a hybrid of a hedge fund mentality, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably why you can see the swing vote around whether or not I'm a good CEO or not on, on the chat lines. So it's a combination of a hedge fund mentality and the really incredible world of design and development that my partner, Justin, infused into the company. And so I bring that up because when we first started the platform, I've said before that our mission was to make money on the internet, right? Yeah, and that's not our mission today when people ask me what our mission is today. Today, our North Star metric has to do with the success of creators on our platform and what we're trying to create for them and the plans we have in the future for them. But a long time ago, when we began the company, that notion seemed so far-fetched to so many people who were married to the display advertising model. And so if back in those days, we had to almost translate for people uh, what we could make on a CPM basis imagine if cpms had stayed what they were from the times when youtube you'd be you'd be rolling in it if you if youtube was still paying out the way they did back then mm -hmm. but they would not really to them the money was more about discovery and research you think you were being rewarded back then all those people even today the people who make all the money on youtube the value to youtube is significantly higher still yeah. because of the data it provides. Mm -hmm. And so you're right that data is something that people speak about, um, but perhaps not deeply enough. Um, soon after Justin joined, our mission became, all right, we solved how to make money. That answer was simple partner with creators in a transparent and honest environment, give them a suite of tools that will help them be more effective at their craft and charge them a fair price for what you offer. And we did that. And then the mission was, well, if we do that, we'll be successful as a company. And so when you talk about sort of the concept of uh, what we do with the data, 
first and foremost, the data is there to strengthen the creators, period. Mm -hmm. First and foremost. So targeting for creators to come on board, join challenges that are sponsored by brands became a much more acceptable way for us to work with a good North Star metric with brands. Meaning if we work with a brand, it's because that brand supports the creative community like Moleskin. Those are the type of brands, in fact, that we are targeting. Targeting is not really the right word. We basically in, you know, invite to come work with us. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other creator-oriented brands that we want to have that kind of relationship with. But when we target utilizing data, it's to find creators to come join the communities. When we target for brands, it's to bring awareness to the brand who's bringing creators to the challenge. Mm -hmm. And then when we target for them in branded content or an Amazon performance in the performance uh, agency area that we acquired within Seller's Choice, in those moments we're targeting with data that is specific to the brand's articles itself. Mm -hmm. And that's really our plans with it. We don't, you know, when it comes to thinking about data, there are multiple ways to utilize one's data. But I think when you look at how we do it, it's creator first. And, you know, there's probably the 80-20 rule at worst, I think as opposed to the display model, which was probably 99-1 as far as the win-win. But remember, some sense of balance in that environment is correct because brands, brands trust a community that has qualified creators and qualified creators trust a community that doesn't have intrusive advertising but makes its money from non-invasive vocal for brands articles that are partnered or collaborated on through our vocal creator network, once again, providing a creator first opportunity. Mm -hmm. Does that okay. make sense? Absolutely. And I've read through the, the 10K a few times now, and I think it, I think I remember correctly that created does not sell data they don't sell my per you guys don't sell my personal information as revenue stream is that correct that is absolutely correct uh that is a uh, a strong principle that was established by the design and development infused with the hedge fund institutional environment that we're talking about mm -hmm. and so no we do not sell we do not sell our data we utilize our data to enhance our ability to service the creative community gotcha yeah that makes a lot of sense um so <laughs> you've talked about this hedge fund slash institution sort of mindset i guess you could say uh and that is a good segue into this question uh, and it and it's. Do you have any plans for an investor roadshow or to present at any conferences in the near future? Well, uh, there aren't really that many uh, conferences to attend yet. Mm -hmm. um, we watch the the conferences closely. We really do. Um, I think that one has to move through the digital space, which is now the conference space. In the old days, old days, two years ago, um, a conference uh, had multiple objectives that someone like me would look at, right? I'd go there, maybe I'd speak. If I spoke, would it really matter? Who would be in the room? 
And I would do all that research to understand the value of doing that. But then there was the value of looking certain people in the eye, knowing whether or not when they say they haven't sold a share that they really haven't sold a share. I love the company. You know, that part of it gets lost. And I missed that part. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly missed the, the sitting down over uh, a good, you know, lunch and, and hearing about other people's investments because I learned so much from those dialogues. But that's not how I wouldn't spend time planning those kind of things anymore because that world is now digital. And whether it goes back to being some hybrid of it, in the next 18 months, it's not. And so then we put our time into thinking about what is a digital conference? You don't just want to start jumping into them because, well, that that's counterintuitive to our second mover advantage. I've been listening to a lot of uh, small cap companies and small cap CEOs uh, do their conference calls and and do their road shows. I've been learning a lot about it. And I would say that I'm sure there are more than a few that are well done and the right type of conference for us to speak at. Um, But again, uh, who is it that really is the audience that matters to me, right? For instance, you wouldn't want to speak to necessarily fast money crowds. Mm -hmm. And some conferences, as the lines begin to get real blurry between institutional, retail, influencer, analyst, and all these things, real CEOs have to move much more carefully today. Mm -hmm. It's called the multiple truth theory. You're a CEO, you get up, you say something. One group hears one thing, another group hears another thing. It's factual that I only said one thing. And so again, I I wouldn't say that you have road shows to look forward to. I would say that we're going to keep the investors, as we always have, aware and up to speed on what we're doing as transparently as we've done. But I would always suggest signing up for our investor relations newsletter that we're going to be putting together uh, or some sort of a regular uh, structure for people to get insight into what we're doing rather than having to have them register at an online conference until we understood it better. Mm -hmm. And so I I think maybe I'm giving you a little more insight into us as a group, as opposed to when we're really getting on the road. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I guess we can, we can discuss the, (laughs) what you got drilled for the whole NFT talk. And I thought it was kind of funny actually, personally. Um, but I think a lot of the, the weak handed, I guess you could say day traders that were looking to make a quick profit on the, on the stock price, uh, tuned out after you stated that you were not in NFT play. Uh, and however, I can recall later, later in that same conference call, you mentioned you actually do have plans to mint a select few NFTs and see if it works for the business model and shareholders. And I think a lot of people missed that because they got so frustrated. Um, so maybe if you could just expand on that a little bit, but also what is the timeline on something like this? Are we actively seeking out the minting of a select few of the NFTs? Um, yeah. Um, we're not an NFT play. That, that's... Value is in the eye of the beholder, true. And people's perception of stock, what it is, people have their right to do that. Mm -hmm. And we live in an age where 
again, I said before to you, there's a graying occurring in the middle blend of the traders of today. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's what makes markets. I came from that world. Mm -hmm. But when I was trading back in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, I had a vision of how a CEO tasked with the kind of fiduciary responsibility that I have uh, communicated during times of extreme volatility. And I would watch tons of merger arbitrage stocks trade with incredible spreads, contracting and expanding and expanding and contracting. And people would get bombarded with questions. What's going on? What's happening to the deal? Why is the stock up? Back in those days, it would happen on a telephone. <laughs> but things changed. And you can't necessarily be a CEO who doesn't speak up mm -hmm. when we live in a world where information is often subjective and taken for objective. And so when someone like me approaches what was an overwhelming amount of questions about something that up until people started asking was not on our radar, if someone were to ask me, are we an NFT play? I would be remiss to say anything other than no. <laughs> what I did say is that we are curious and that we explore tech all the time. We explore influencer platforms. We explore marketplace platforms. We explore third-party data platforms. And now we're going to, yes, explore a, hand few, a, a, a handful of uh, uh, platforms that are sustainable, uh, are sustainably oriented, that they are moving towards some sort of uh, a method that has a balance between uh, the sustainable versus, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the type of sustainability that different platforms have relative to how they go about mining and, and, and the carbon emissions that that gives off. And that's something that I don't know enough about yet to ever say I would do it in scale. Mm -hmm. And so it moves down to a level where it becomes about economics when it comes to new platforms, new technologies, whether it's trying out uh, uh, selling a book by a handful of creators on our platform through Amazon or taking a few prints from a art collection we have and learning about minting, which is what I said at the end. I'm sure there are a few platforms that fall into the category uh, of, uh, of the type of platforms that we would associate ourselves with. When and if that's decided upon, then we'll follow through on exactly what I said on the call. And anybody who didn't hear it, didn't listen, tuned out, it was simply to go and determine what the process of minting a few of the pieces in the collection and offering them 
in an NFT marketplace. Other than that, I have no NFT plans. Gotcha. Well, thanks for the explanation there. Um, and I just have to say, I, I respect that. I respect the, di the discipline you have. And it's part of the reason I've entrusted you with my investment. Um, let's go with one more, I guess you'd say material question before we get a little broader. Um, you mentioned, and I mentioned this previously in the, inter in the interview too, but you mentioned 2022 being the year for a potential big acquisition. Uh, my question is, are you looking at acquiring a separate platform to connect creators and consumers outside of written articles, such as connecting artists or record labels and playlist curators slash influencers in the music industry? Are we going to stick to something with written form? No, it's, it's the latter. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's the prior, meaning we, we are actively looking at platforms of all types. Um, as I said before, Vocal was built to be uh, accretive, meaning the connective tissue for us to um, work productively with other platforms is the nature of the framework that Justin and his partners built. And we definitely are looking at other creator platforms in different mediums and different formats. And that's when I say I'm looking for an acquisition in 2022, uh, that's true. I'm very transparent and what I say is what I try to follow through on as a CEO. And so people, when they think about our revenues and our projections and they start factoring in all sorts of potentials, I broke it out and said the type of things I'm looking for in 2021 are much more agency related and you alluded to them earlier. In 2022, it's much more technology oriented. Okay. Yeah, that makes me really excited as a shareholder personally. Um, just, just seeing the, the potential for growth here with the creative acquisitions. Um, so let's go ahead and move to a more, more broad question. And this comes from my community, actually. And it's just a simple, what do you view as the biggest short-term obstacle for the company? It's like saying I could switch the question and say, what's the most valuable asset to you? What's the most valuable part of your organization? Mm -hmm. Because your, your greatest obstacle is whatever threatens that. The great thing about our company is the collective nature of the management team and the time we've been together. Um, I actually... That's, that's, that's interesting. I, what, I, I'm not sure uh, if I would have answered it the same way a year ago as I am now. I mean, a year ago, I would have said the biggest obstacle is getting up to the NASDAQ. Yeah. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I would have said the biggest obstacle is making sure that you're comfortable with the quarterly revenue guidance you've given for Q1 and Q2. Diane. Uh, keeping my group, my management team uh, motivated, culturally cohesive, mm -hmm. engaged, productive during the last year uh, has been an incredible challenge. Uh, I think part of what has made me able to get through it, Rex, has been what we talked about earlier was my understanding that the thing is not the thing. And so I didn't get married to the notion that we were never going back to a, a more normalized 
in office infrastructure, I was always preparing for its eventuality. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people restructured their business because they believe it's final stasis. And it isn't. Mm -hmm. And so the obstacle that faces me today is not the same one that faced me three months ago, you understand. Mm -hmm. And because I don't believe in that stasis concept, that final stasis, that previous tech companies, financial companies, managers, and other people that I have met, that was their Achilles heel, was believing in that final stasis. Mm -hmm. When I look at my biggest obstacle today, it's getting my group back to the office in a safe environment where they can feel as motivated as they previously did and continue to be as educated um, and experienced by being in this kind of environment that we have here at our company, which promotes, uh, um, you know, learning, gaining knowledge, and then taking risk. And that's what the executives at this office do every day with their planning and ideating of features for the platform, uh, other businesses for us to work with, discussions with influencers, creators, and the time we spend working with brands. At all times, we are learning, trying to help balance knowledge with pushing up against boundaries throughout our company, from me down to the linesman, all the way through, we're all cultured. And that culture and the disruption of it that was caused has created at this moment in time, my greatest obstacle. Good answer. Um... Let's, let's go ahead and move into the, the one and only, not the only, but the question that I am most looking forward to hearing your answer about, and that's question nine. Um, so I know you have a history with the stock market. I obviously have a community revolving around the stock market. I know your favorite community on Vocal is the trader community. Um, and, I, and I got to brainstorming. I think a Rex Finance and Jeremy Fromer sponsored trader challenge on Vocal would be very successful. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, how do you see it? What would be the challenge? Do you see it as a classic, just pick the stock and prove to me that it can go to a certain point? For instance, the first thing we'd have to ideate is what's the challenge? What's the attraction? for a creator to enter the challenge. Yeah, um, it could be what you just referenced. Uh, it could be just people writing down their, their bullish thesis on different stocks. And then we, we judge, you know, which, which, which are the best put together, which ones we believe in. Um, yeah, I'm open to suggestion, but this could be fun. Well, I think that you want to try to hit the low hanging fruit to fit, uh, first out, right? And so I think maybe you do something more straightforward, like, and keep people in sort of a zone for a moment of, you know, what, the, what and why are the top three components that contribute to the success of a company? I like that. But I'll tell you what, so let's help, let's help you out a little bit. Oh, wait, do you have more questions for me? No, that was, that was the last one, I think. Okay. Now I'd like to hear you speak a little bit so you can see what it's like. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, you'll use this on your Rex finance community. But I have a couple of questions. So when was your first trade? When did you do, how, how far back in your memory? Some kids, they remember the first time they hit a baseball. 
<laughs> you remember probably the first trade you did. Yes. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> so that would have been 2016. I had my dad open me his custodial account with TD Ameritrade. Um, no history whatsoever of investors in my family. I come from a, a farm family through the generations that's been passed down. Uh, and they didn't even have retirement accounts. So me being interested in the stock market is, is really weird for my family, I guess you could say. Um, but to answer your question, my, my first stock I bought and this, I had no idea what I was doing. I'll just say that right away. Um, but I think everybody, it's the, it's the cost of tuition in the stock market. You learn. Um, what I did was I Googled, uh, I saw an article talking about 10 different stocks. Uh, I picked three of them. One of them was Riot Blockchain at $3.50, I think. The other was a company called Jivo. And then the third was a, um, a company called High Crush Partners. <laughs> uh, obviously, I don't own any of those stocks anymore. High Crush Partners went bankrupt. They actually ended up giving their executives a bonus a week before they declared bankruptcy. Uh, Riot Blockchain, hindsight is 2020, as they say, which I held that one. But again, I had, I had no idea, you know? I didn't know what Bitcoin was. I just saw this company in an article. And then Jivo, obviously. Uh, I held on to that one the longest. Uh, I ended up selling out because I was not a big fan of the management team. Once I became to, I was able to start understanding the stock market and the ways companies work more and more. And I haven't, I haven't hidden it on my channel. I, I'm just not a fan of Jivo's management team, which is why I still am not an investor today. And that's why I sold out of my investment that I had back in the day. Now it was a very small investment, right? I started with like a hundred dollars per stock or whatever it was, but you live and you learn. What platform were you uh, trading on then? TD Ameritrade. So they had their own internal trading. So you weren't, you didn't have a front end that you were using or something like that. Do you still use TD Ameritrade today? I do for, I, I set up my Roth IRA account last year, maxed it out. Um, so I use, I use TD Ameritrade for my Roth IRA, which is obviously a little more, um, less risky with those investments. Um, cause I'm only 19, so I have plenty of years to grow that. Um, but my, my main, my main portfolio we follow on my YouTube channel is what I like to call my speculative portfolio. And obviously it gets more views because it's more entertaining to watch a speculative portfolio. And that portfolio is on Robin hood. Hmm. You know, you're a perfect example of, uh, if someone wanted to say about the drinking age, it's like, you're not letting this guy have a drink at the end of his day. Um, so so you, you did your trades, and then how did your journey from there to YouTube uh, arrive? Yeah, so I actually, I don't know if hardly any of my viewers will remember this unless they know me personally, I actually back in the day, made YouTube videos on video games. Um, so that kind of gave me a base understanding of SEO, search engine optimization, how to grow a YouTube channel. And then, you know, I, I, was like, I, I just, my, in my, it was my high school um, business teacher ran a virtual stock market competition. The first time I played in it, I set a, the school record for the highest return in a semester. Um, so from that, I kind of, I, I decided, wow, I, I, I like making money. I mean, who doesn't like making money, but I figured, you know, I might explore this some more because it could be something I'm good at. Maybe I got lucky, but you know, let's, let's learn more. Let's, let's increase my knowledge on the subject. So then I started doing the real research that an investor should do. In my opinion, reading the 10 K's, listening to the conference calls, doing the hard work that nobody else wants to do. Um, and through that, my knowledge about companies and stocks is just, it's, it's incredible. 
<laughs> and, I, and I know that because whenever I ask my dad or my mom who have watched a recent YouTube video I did and they say, I had no clue what you're referencing or no clue what you were talking about. And I'm 19 years old. My dad's 57, right? So long answer, but <laughs> that's the way I came to it. I had the, the base level knowledge about YouTube. I started having some more success because I, I worked hard. I did the work nobody else wanted to do. Um, and I, I put the two together. I don't remember the reason why I decided to do that. If you go back and watch my first video I did on my YouTube channel, it was, it was rough. I still have it public because I'm a transparent guy, right? I want to see, I want to let people see the progress I've made personally. Um, but yeah. Exceptional answer. In fact, one of the reasons why we're sitting here doing this interview is because that's who you really are. And to me, a lot of what I do at this stage of my career is advocate for individuals like yourself. Mm -hmm. I advocated for every individual that works in my company. Everyone that's worked here for the last couple of years, I advocated such that they could be the very best of themselves. You have that work ethic component of what we say are the four important components to work at our company. Mm -hmm. They're in no particular order, work ethic, intellect, abstract thinking, and moral compass. If you have those four components, then you have a shot at working at our company in whatever shape, form, that you can be the best version of yourself. That's how we define our company. It's how you define yourself also. You search knowledge because your work ethic is strong, probably resulting from the fact of how many generations have been working the farm. What time do, what time do people get up in your household? It depends on the season. Um, how, what's the early season? Tell me. Is there a rooster that goes off in the morning near your house? <laughs> Not a physical rooster, but I, I remember growing up, my dad... And I, obviously I was in middle school, whatever there in high school, even <laughs> there were times where I went a week, two weeks without seeing my dad, because he would stay out so late at night farming. And he'd go out so early in the morning. And then I had school during the day and we just, I was in bed by the time he got home, he was awake. Right. <laughs> you get it. I do. I really do. I had a father who also, uh, had a work ethic that inspired me. And so this hard work that you did, it gave you control of the vernacular, which is very important. Meaning your ability to express yourself financially rivals many an analyst I've met through my career. That doesn't mean you have what they have, which is what you're acquiring. Many of them have a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And so that's okay. You'll get your own frame of reference, but you understand business modeling, balance sheet, you understand cash flow, you understand the components that really make for someone to be able to uh, opine on the topic. And I think you're right. I think what distinguishes you is, I can tell it by your questions, that you do the hard work that's necessary to understand the company. And I alluded, it, I alluded to it earlier with you when I said, I'm not looking for fast money. It will come because it comes. But I can't say things that will ever... Uh, uh, represent a catalyst for fast money. I want long-term investors such as yourself, people who can understand the company. And it doesn't matter today with Robinhood, whether it's a fraction of a th share, a few thousand or hundreds of thousands or millions by institutions. 
It's about a good shareholder base, a tight shareholder base, one that can give us good feedback. We appreciate your feedback. We, we appreciate all the feedback we see. Some of it as uh, <laughs> even the, even the, um, uh, the ones that aren't particularly flattering. Uh, when somebody takes the time to give us their opinion, we assimilate it all into what we do as a collective. And having your opinions and your insight uh, was very interesting for us to see. And we, we look forward to um, you interviewing other CEOs that can appreciate the fact that if you took the time to do the hard work that you did, unlike other groups, then we as CEOs, irrespective of your age, irrespective even of your frame of reference, should take the time to give individuals like yourself, creators, influencers, the people buying their products, we should give you a voice. You are right to ask the questions. That's part of our mission at Creative. And so when you asked at the beginning, who are we? What are we? We are some, uh, some incredible company that came together over years of hard work, whose mission it is to work and collaborate with the creative community. Influencers of all shapes and sizes, of all ages, of all interests. That's what created is. And we appreciate you being a part of our community. Well, hey, I really appreciate that. I think you gave me quite an endorsement there. I don't know if I deserve it, but. Well, <laughs> you do deserve it if you do the hard work, man. That's, if you don't do the hard work, the minute you stop, you know the saying on Wall Street, you're only as good as your last trade. Yeah. And, and so for those who really want to follow an influencer, that influencer, he can make mistakes. Yeah. Everybody's human. I make tons of mistakes all the time. I learn from them. And the key is, are you doing the hard work like I do to run my company, which you heard about today? Are you doing the hard work to follow the companies that you're following so that your reputation and your credibility has nothing to do with age? It has to do with a meritocracy that should exist around knowledge and work like you put into it. Anyway, I have to run, but it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, look forward to our speaking next time.